Ready? Yeah. Let's just melt some cables. This, I mean, you're definitely in a runaway thermal scenario. I think we were earlier, too. I think we were at six point something mm -hmm. amps. Yeah. Where if you left it alone, it would... It, it's it just going to compound. Yeah. Oh, oh dude, dude, check it out. <laughs> yeah, there, it's about to go. I hear crackling. Yeah, I actually, I definitely hear crackling at this point. Most fires are bad, and using cables which are poorly designed, or using cables in a way for which they weren't intended, is a great way to potentially lead to one of those aforementioned bad fires. Now, this topic is about cable quality and using cables in situations where they might be under more stress than they were designed for, potentially leading to an unsafe use case. We first came up with this idea after working on the, or during working on the NZXT H1 riser issue, whereupon the earlier versions of NZXT's H1 were shipped with a riser and case combination that could result in a fire. Whole separate video series on that if you're curious. And what we realized while researching bad cables and cables that can cause problems like this is that there's, there's a whole special level of unethical product development as it relates to cables, which are specced, uh, marketed for one thing and, and maybe specced in a way that isn't fully supportive of that thing, depending on the user's understanding of what they're trying to buy, what they're trying to use it for. So we've recently noticed a particularly high surge in combinations of questionably suited hardware, GPUs plus riser cables as a result of the current mining craze. In this video, we are not making any commentary whatsoever on whether you should or should not be mining cryptocurrency. We have no part in that. We don't want to participate in that conversation. What we care about is that the people who are participating in it or those who are using risers anyway to build deep learning or rendering or whatever rigs, uh, we want to make sure that those people are doing so in a way that doesn't result in their house burning down. And certainly we've seen photos posted online of people's actual rooms going up in flames as a result of using a poor combination of hardware or ending up unlucky. Now this piece, even if you're not mining or planning to use these types of cables, should still be useful to you because we're going to be exploring wire gauge, the spec and how far outside of spec cables can survive, and in general, uh, concepts of PC building and safe practices of working with electronics and hardware that should be useful even for just normal PC building if at some point, for example, you try to connect a few things with adapters that maybe aren't suited for it. So this should be useful to everyone even though we're focusing on the particularly unsafe riser cable discussion. Before that, this video is brought to you by you and our Patreon backers. This kind of in-depth testing and acquisition of elaborate testing tools is simply not sustainable without direct support via patreon.com slash gamersnexus or our products on store.gamersnexus.net like the mod mats. Our Patreon backers will be getting a special behind the scenes upload with our test engineer, Patrick Stone, showing all the detailed information about how this power testing works. You can also get access to our community Discord and other behind the scenes tours, explainers and Q&A videos for Patreon only. If you like learning about computer hardware, check out patreon.com slash gamersnexus to support what we're doing. Alternatively, if you'd like to support another way, visit store.gamersnexus.net and consider grabbing one of our ever popular mod mats, now available in three designs, or one of our wireframe mouse mats. So like we said, using the wrong cable can cost everything. We've seen a couple of posts on Reddit and elsewhere, other forums, mining forums especially, where people have had not just GPUs, but actual belongings, houses, parts of houses burn up because they walked away from a system that was running components that were maybe not really as advertised in terms of the wire gauge or the spec, or they were misusing those components and it resulted in, in pulling too much power and causing something to melt down somewhere. For this video, we'll be using our lab equipment. So that includes power supply, testing equipment. We're going to be using a sun moon and a load generator along with a variac and a couple of other parts. The total cost for all this stuff is somewhere in the range of eight to $10,000 depending. And uh, we've had it for quite a while now, but we've been using it lately for some power supply tests, which we'll talk about more separately, and for these cable tests, because they, the equipment allows us to, in a very controlled fashion, generate power loads to put the cables under so that we can stress them with different scenarios without having to swap hardware in and out and without having to jeopardize hardware like GPUs just to test a cable that we're pretty sure is going to fail. And as stated in the Patreon ad, if you want to support this type of work where we 
use all of this equipment and try to buy more equipment in the future, you can always go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get extra behind the scenes videos, including one which will in more detail explain the equipment we're using. If you're really interested in the methodology and the how it works behind the scenes stuff, that'll be on Patreon. Or you can go to store.gamersnexus.net and grab things like our toolkits or mouse mats. So regarding risers, we want to do our part to contribute to everyone's safety. This is something you can use outside of mining as well. Like we said, certain types of deep learning can make use of GPUs hooked up via risers like this. Depends on how much bandwidth they need via the PCIe slot. So our intent here isn't to say that mining's good or bad, and we're not promoting it. But with the recent increase of promotion and of mining with a casual audience, with people who have a lot of dollar bills in their eyes, we want to keep everyone safe. With regard to the mining community, our understanding is that the mining community uses risers because they allow single slot PCIe motherboard spacing to fit multi-slot GPUs in a rack or something like that in a way which allows them to, to get enough bandwidth for mining without taking up uh, more PCIe lanes than necessary so that people can cram more cards into one motherboard. We have some photos we've lifted from uploaders to Reddit and elsewhere to help demonstrate all this, including some photos of those burned out mining rigs. We've seen people do a lot of interesting things in some of these photos, maybe intentionally, maybe not, but one example is people wrapping cables around the metal poles or the bench legs and components uh, in a way that if things start melting, maybe it helps because it's a thermal conductor, or maybe it causes a direct short to ground and causes a big fire. When fires happen in these situations, they typically happen from a few key points that we'll explore today. Number one is unpowered risers causing a point of failure. Running too many risers off of a single power supply cable would be another one, which applies to non-mining GPU use also. And buying cables online in general being a gamble. Those are our three aspects we're exploring. The cables, for example, might be lying to you about their wire gauge, listing maybe 18 gauge, but actually being 20 or 22. And that, if you're expecting one thing, and getting at something worse can cause serious problems. If you've spent any time researching risers to buy some, then you're probably aware that they come in a ton of different form factors. They can also connect to several different PCIe interfaces, and there's a bunch of different cables used for power delivery. Speaking of power delivery, for our first point of safety, don't use an unpowered riser. Most graphics cards draw power from the PCIe slot, but some risers don't provide power to the slot. If the GPU can't get power from the PCIe slot, it may not turn on, if you're lucky. It could also malfunction. Or there's a possibility that it draws power from another possibly overloaded source. So if you're going to mine or build any kind of multi-GPU farm for something, please at least make sure to select risers that provide a powered connection. And to take it a step further, make sure the power connection uses cables that are up to the task. As for power delivery, that's our next topic. When graphics cards draw power from risers via inadequate hardware, melting can happen. And in extreme cases, that fire we've talked about. Unlike PCIe power cables that are directly connected from the power supply and functionally specced for high current, riser power cables don't really have any standardization. That's because there's no standard. PCIe slot power delivery can literally be a guessing game here. On the PCB containing the by 16 slot, you might see a 4-pin Molex, a 6-pin PCIe, a 4-pin Berg connector providing power, or something else. According to PCI SIG, the slot is supposed to provide 75 watts of power. Part of that, however, is delivered as 3.3 volts. The majority of it is 12 volts. The spec says that the 12 volt pins in the PCIe slot should be able to deliver 5.5 amps or 66 of the 75 total watts of power. So the key to identifying potentially dangerous hardware is finding out if the wires and connectors that bring the 12 volt power to risers is appropriate. As we take a look at potential ways that things could go wrong, keep in mind one important thing. We are not green lighting any risers or any particular cables in this video. That's not the goal. What we're trying to do is convey where potential danger can occur and point out the most obvious ways that it could potentially be identified. But we're not going to be endorsing any products because it's absolute chaos. We've noticed that there are very few brand name vendors in the game and the supply changes all the time. So good luck basically with choosing one, but just approach it with some level of reason. As you saw in the opener, multiple risers on a single SATA power supply cable isn't always a great idea. Several crypto mining advice posts we found on Reddit suggest that it's okay to connect one or two risers to a four pin Molex or say to power supply cable, but an inexperienced user might connect risers to every connector on the PSU cable. So we wanted to see what happens in that scenario, and we'll start our video with the worst possible combination.
To create the mess you witnessed, we combined the worst of all of our testing results. We created this scenario by connecting a $2 4 pin Molex to SATA cable from AliExpress, three 6 pin PCIe to SATA cables to a single PSU SATA cable. We then cranked up the current beyond the PCI SIG specs until we achieved some of the carnage. You could also connect one Molex to three-way SATA splitter, then connect four of those to a single power supply cable for 12 GPUs off one cable if you want to seek a guarantee of a meltdown or a fire or destruction of hardware. Just to be clear here, this combination of things we're describing to achieve the failure we got is an unlikely combination. We manufactured this particular damage by intentionally exceeding the spec. However, this can happen if luck of the draw on the random cable supplier isn't in your favor and we don't want it to happen to you. Cards can exceed spec too, so it's not wholly unrealistic if you connect a bunch of RTX 3090 FTW3s to one bad cable. So in order to get the level of fail that we achieved, um, we started with two SATA connectors on a single SATA PSU cable that terminated in PCI Express 6-pin. And we plugged these guys into our power supply tester to draw 5.5 amps for each one. And the 5.5 amps is, again, what we have uh, as the PCI SIG spec for a single PCI Express slot. And we figured that this wouldn't cause any problems, uh, 11 amps across this wire, because these wires from power supplies are 18 gauge. And 18 gauge wires at 30 C are supposed to handle something like 10 amps. And since we're in here sitting at 23 degrees C, open air, we should be able to do 11 amps with no problem. Uh, since we're looking at wires, current, and temperatures, possibly dangerous temperatures, uh, let's talk about current capacity and temperature factored in. Uh, the key term here is ampacity. Uh, we know that mining rigs dump lots of heat. Uh, as that heat increases ambient temperature, it means that our wires here are going to have a reduction in the rate that they can dissipate heat. And if these guys can't dissipate heat, then the resistance inside is going to increase. If our graphics card uh, continues to pull current at the same rate and we've got increased resistance, there's going to be more increased heat. Then there's also the sheath's ability to dissipate heat and you got voltage drop, but let's try and keep it all simple. And just note that wires don't respond well to high current loads and increasing ambient temperature. All that together, ampacity. As we added a third power connector, uh, it's just another PCI Express to SATA connector. Um, the load on the SATA power supply cable is now like 16 and a half amps. And even though we're a bit skeptical, we were guessing that because many things in computers are over-engineered, the cable could probably handle it. And uh, our meters, our thermocouples, showed that the peak average temperature did go from 62C in our two cable test to 84C in our three cable test. And it's worth noting that the 80C on the sheath was exceeded at 84, so. Just to jump in, this isn't a delta T measurement this time. Ambient was controlled and it's easier to see the power supply cable sheaths rated for 80C are now outside of spec by introducing a third simulated riser and just using the temperature that comes out. We let the cables cook for a while, but in the end, the over parts survived with no melting or damage. Because our power supply had four SATA connectors though, we proceeded to plug in the fourth connector to see what would happen. We thought this might be the breaking point, so we decided to do multiple runs of this test. In our first attempt with 22 amps of current, the temperature jumped up rapidly. The peak average was 119C, and it was achieved in only 160 seconds. We let it cook for about 25 minutes, which is good for this test, but in an environment where there's actual mining going on and there's a high density of high power GPUs, this will run one for longer and two in a hotter ambient. So at the end of this testing in our lab environment, the cable didn't smell very good. It was becoming a little bit smoky. And the cable also started to lose some integrity and became sticky to the touch. It did technically survive though. We don't think it would survive very many cycles of this because again, it was becoming compromised, but it did survive this test. In our final attempt, we decided to force the issue by pushing more current through the wire than the PCI SIG recommendation. We started the first test at five and a half amps and the temperature again jumped over hundred degrees Celsius in about one minute. 
For this iteration of the test, we kept each testing interval short so as to efficiently determine what an actual failure would look like in reality. It was the Mythbusters approach of, if it doesn't fail, let's make it fail so we understand what it would look like. As soon as we saw the rate of temperature increase drop, we stepped up the current to 6.5 amps across all four cables. This put the SATA power supply cable under 26 amps of load. Temperatures began to climb rapidly once again, and after a few more minutes, a faint smoke could be seen coming from the sheath of the 12 volt wire on the SATA power supply cable. Let's do six, I guess, six and a half. You got it. So that is now at 335 watts. Mm -hmm. But it's pulled from the wall. Yeah. And if you want to see how much is, is being pulled here, uh, is like power factor basically. Uh, you go over here and you hit the watts button on the okay. sun moon. And you can see it's pulled at 270 out okay. at the interface of yeah. the power supply. Maybe yeah, a little that, melty. That yeah. smells pretty bad. <laughs> yeah, I smell a little bit of uh, melting. All right. um, well, oh, okay. yep, yep. Something is definitely is putting off smoke. So we've got 110 somewhere. Where is that? 110's right there. Can you guys see where the smoke's coming from? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this is pretty typical of what we've seen from the mining riser fires, right? Let's say maybe whatever's melting here melts and then it's happy again, <laughs> right? Uh, if, if you cycle this on and off, on and off, on and off, this sheathing is going to get brittle. Yeah. And then once it gets brittle, uh, it, it will eventually crack, and then you have a likely exposed short. Yeah. Seeing visual signs of the cable breaking down led us to believe that even in our well-cooled 2122C office, the PSU cable sheath would have eventually melted and caused the failure. We were still interested in seeing what that cable could handle before slow deterioration occurred. So we pushed the envelope and set the current to 7.5 amps per cable, or 30 amps total. The smoking got worse, but we were looking for something more indicative of near instantaneous breakdown. We manually increased the current above 8 amps on each cable, and at this point, the sheath started to bubble up and break away from the conductor. Catastrophic failure at this point was achieved. Oh man, that's kind of cool looking. It's definitely just melting away. Yeah, that, can you see that bottom one, Andrew? It's oh, really look shiny. At that. Look at that right there. It's dripping, right? Yep, it got, you got bubble. So we're dripping at 138 at the Oh, dude, check it out. <laughs> yeah, it's about to go. So there's a lot of ways this could become it's one former. Down there yeah. too. There's a lot of ways this could become catastrophic. As it melts, you get a short circuit. <laughs> look at it bubbling up. And... Uh, <laughs> It could short and get a lot worse, or it could just burn out and shut off. There's some big bubbles up here. Yeah. Sorry, Cable. <laughs> You're a martyr for the cause. I don't know that it's going to light. I, I, think I it, don't think it will. I think it would light if, like, two wires sheathing started melting and they mm -hmm. shorted yep then it would probably light yep and that's definitely possible if you're in this scenario yeah. down here it's pretty bad actually it's bubbled all the way yeah that that particular sheath is toast this would eventually lead to the cable melting through the header at the power supply or through the neighboring wires which would cause in either instance a direct short and that's where you'd potentially get your fire flaring up. The thing to remember here is that at the 5.5 amp load, the power supply cable was well above its ADC sheath rating. Over time, especially in a worse ambient temperature environment, that level of heat could break down the cable. Also keep in mind that at 6.5 amps, the power draw on each individual cable is 78 watts, which is out of spec, but isn't unheard of in GPU slot power draw. We saw similar numbers to this in some of the early, early 3090 FTW3 testing when we first reviewed the cart. So while it's true that we were creating this failure, it's still a good idea to plan any mining rig, if you're into that, with the worst case scenario in mind. And if you're doing some deep learning or rendering rig or whatever that also uses these cables, the same applies to you as it would for mining. We may have gotten lucky with our cables and our power supply choice and with our combination of components and temperature. Other people, as evidence online shows, ended up with fires. So we see how that could be created with this data. Next on to individual cable testing. We started our individual cable testing by focusing on the SATA side of the cables and we did our best to melt these connectors using our load tester in what we considered a real world scenario. We only used molded plastic connectors as these were the ones shown melting all across the internet, at least in the early days. Of the three cables we used for this test, 
Two came from riser kits, and the other one was about $1 to $2 and separate. Although there are options below a dollar, we couldn't get them fast enough. We only pulled current across the 12 volt wire, and at 1, 2, and 3 amp loads, the cables were fine. Five minutes after beginning a 4 amp load test, the molded SATA connectors from our unit that we bought were warm to the touch. As we progressed to 5 amps and then 5.5, the differentiation in cable quality became much more pronounced through temperature variation. Both of the cables that came with our riser kits gained a few degrees Celsius. Nothing bad. Now that doesn't mean that yours would also be of decent quality, because buying cables like this from AliExpress or Amazon is like playing whack-a-mole. You have no idea what quality you're going to get. The 6-pin peak average delta was 11.3 degrees Celsius, and the 4-pin averaged out to 11.7. Both looked like flat lines when compared to the variability, though, of the cheap cable that we purchased. The cheap cable SATA connector peaked with average deltas around 47C, far higher than the 11C increase on the other cables. To see if we could push it to the melting point, we tried to emulate power draw spikes by raising the current levels to 8 amps and 10 amps in one second bursts, not sustained, which we've observed a similar behavior before. The temperature increased 3 to 4 degrees Celsius, but each time it returned to the previous temperature after a few seconds. In a high ambient with neighboring cards dumping heat, though, these numbers could be worse. Both wires claim to be 18 gauge, but judging by our data, it's likely that the cheaper one isn't actually that thick. Reading through forum posts, illegitimately labeled power wires seem to be a thing when purchasing low-priced risers. The wires may say 18 gauge on the outside. But it's often just a thicker sheath that's designed to disguise the true wire size. This also isn't unheard of outside of mining and could apply to other types of cables you buy for, well, almost anything. In addition to there being a possible problem with wire gauge, SATA connectors shouldn't actually be able to handle the 5.5 amps that the PCI SIG spec requests anyway. The 12 volts delivered through a 15 pin SATA connector transfers through only three of the contacts and these contacts are only rated for 1.5 amps on a thin 28 gauge piece of metal. All three contacts are part of a single terminal, which means the standard SATA connector is only supposed to allow for 4.5 amps, or 54 watts. While this clearly falls short of the 5.5 amp PCIe slot number in our test thus far, even the cheapest cable was technically able to handle the load without having a meltdown. Again, that doesn't mean they're all safe, but this particular one did fine. Another cable we threw into the mix was the Berg to 4-pin Molex or SATA. Our sample had 22-gauge wiring with crimped terminals on both the Berg and 4-pin Molex ends. The test results showed a steady rise in delta T to about 9C. These results sound fine, but we'd strongly advise against using these connectors for much of anything that's higher power. The Berg 4-pin connector, our friend from the floppy drive days, has an electrically weak terminal like the SATA connector. The gauge of the terminal itself is prohibitively small, and the wires that it can crimp are equally thin. Data sheets for the housing and the terminals both recommend only 2 amps per connection. Unlike the SATA connector though, the Berg connector doesn't have 3 contacts that make up a single terminal. So that 2 amps is just 2 amps. Digging further into the data sheets, you'll find that the terminals allow for 20 to 30 gauge wires depending upon which model is selected, but it's worth noting that another cable we obtained managed to cram an 18 gauge wire in. If you run into one on the thinner end, that's definitely a safety risk. The point of safety here is that based on the terminal specifications, you probably shouldn't use this connector even though the wires might not be an issue. Unfortunately, we found Berg connectors featured in at least four different types of risers. There's an M.2 connected version that has a PCIe by 4 slot, an M.2 slot split version that breaks out to two PCIe by 1s, there's a PCIe by 1 to by 16 ribbon cable type, and another ribbon cable type that has PCIe by 1 to an X1 cut slot. Don't use these for higher power tasks though. The other connectors we tested were never really in question, and here's why. The 4 pin Molex side is rated somewhere between 8 and 11 amps, depending on the alloy of the terminal. Any way you look at it, those numbers exceed the 5.5 amps required by the PCIe CEM spec. What's more interesting is the wires that are crimped into the 4-pin Molex terminals. The terminals can handle anything from 14 to 20 gauge wires. True 20 gauge wire should be theoretically suitable as it should carry 6 amps at 30C. But keep in mind that extended periods of mining again create heat in the immediate vicinity. The current capacity will drop if heat increases. In well-designed cables, the most common wire gauge we saw being crimped into these terminals was 18 gauge. 
and it follows logically that if 18 gauge works, then using 16 or 14 gauge will only improve performance. The last of the common riser connectors, the 6-pin PCIe, was built for GPU power and is therefore unlikely to have problems, at least barring the aforementioned lying about wire gauge warnings. The connector and the pin current ratings for the Molex Minifit Junior suggest 9 amps per contact, and the contacts are built to crimp between 16 and 24 gauge wire. This explains why so many mining forums suggest using these connectors whenever possible. While digging through the forums, we found that most of them discourage using SATA connectivity, but they're sold everywhere, so we know that people are definitely using them regardless. We'll discuss a few of the reasons for the precaution, though. First of all, there is one 12 volt circuit in both the SATA and the 4 pin Molex cables, and that's one 12 volt wire and one ground. Each riser could draw 5.5 amps, and if you populated all of the connectors on a power supply cable, usually three or four on a single cable like this one that's uh, dropping bits and pieces of plastic everywhere because we melted it, then you're dealing with 16 and a half or maybe 22 amps. Both of these numbers are probably too high for an 18 gauge wire with an 80 degree Celsius sheet. So as for why it doesn't always fail in every mining rig, the GPU choice plays a major role as some GPUs utilize the PCIe slot much less than others for power. It also depends on the GPUs and how they're configured. If they're undervolted or configured to run at less than 100% power target, the PSU cables are maybe more likely to survive. So wrapping all this up, it's fun to do all the testing on this, and when you're talking power, a load generator is really all you need to do it. We did have trouble creating failures on the particular cables, at least a lot of them, that we had. Some of them are more noticeably bad than others. We've got a couple here pulled aside. We've marked them as being uh, concerning. But depending on luck of the draw and what you buy, you might be okay. The thing is though, there's a couple of key rules you can follow as a general guideline for trying to keep it as safe as possible. And we are, as stated earlier, to reemphasize not green lighting any specific cables uh, because the supply changes a lot. So just being six pin or six pin to Molex or whatever isn't necessarily uh, a green light that everything's good because it's possible they use some stupid gauge of wire that's dangerous, which is uh, unbelievably unethical, first of all, but if it's mismarketed uh, as, say, 16 or 18 gauge or something, and you end up with 22, or just a cheap wire that's poorly made, then it's possible. That's something that otherwise follows all of the basic guidelines, could still catch fire. And of course, there are a lot of variables, too, where you're talking about potentially a rack of multiple GPUs dumping heat onto the cables, maybe, uh, in maybe a hot environment, if there's other GPUs in there, or you're just not running AC to combat it. All of these things add up to create scenarios that are even worse than the ones that we tested in today, which did include some forced, poor case scenarios. Basic guidance, the most we're willing to provide, is that uh, using power cables for risers that have four pin Molex or six pin PCIe connectors whenever possible is probably a good idea in general. Connecting only one or two per power supply cable is a good idea in general. Using a bad power supply is uh, extremely ill-advised and could result in worse things than we saw today because although the power supply we used doesn't have great reviews, it is an expensive one. And there are some places that they've spent a lot of money, potentially the connectors. But if you use a bad power supply, that is a risk that is probably not worth taking. The general advice online to steer clear of SATA delivery for these cables because of the variability in manufacturing quality is good advice. You should steer clear of them. So basics, four pin Molex, six pin PCIe connectors are a good guideline. They can also be lying to you with the wire gauge and the spec of the cable. So just be careful what you buy. Don't spend too little. If it's 10 cents, there's a good reason for that. And being cheap about this stuff, this is really serious. Just like with a power supply, being overly cheap on something that handles or is an intermediary interface and power delivery is a dangerous game to play when you're dealing with as much power as people are talking about with lots of GPUs mining. So don't get too greedy about it and try and cut corners on cables, risers, and power supplies. That's, that's kind of our uh, moral of the story here. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help us fund our research and testing efforts along with new equipment purchases. Uh, we've got toolkits and mouse mats in stock and shipping now, for example. And subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.